Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia. A program that talks about breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations. Let's begin with the headlines first. Unama report highlights multiple human rights violations and abuses under Taliban. Baloch protest against Pakistan's security forces false encounters. And Pakistan continues to disturb peace in Kashmir through cross-border terrorism. The elimination of basic rights in Afghanistan is one of the most notable aspects of the de facto administration to date. A new report from the UN mission in Afghanistan has also confirmed the erosion of human rights across the country since the Taliban takeover in August last year, pointing out they bear responsibility for extrajudicial killings, torture, arbitrary arrests and detentions, and violations of fundamental freedoms. Take a look. Contrary to the promises of moderate rule the Taliban had earlier made, the human rights situation has nosedived to a new low in war-ravaged Afghanistan. The United Nations mission in Afghanistan, UNAMA, said that the ruling Taliban have been carrying out extrajudicial killings. Torture, arbitrary arrests, and inhumane punishments were widespread in the country in the 10-month Taliban rule. The report said that the atrocities were specifically targeting a number of groups those associated with the OSTA government, human rights defenders, and journalists have been frequently targeted under Taliban 2.0. The Taliban had vowed to be moderate during the peace process with the United States, but they haven't lived up to their promise. The Unama's report uh, highlights uh, concerns, concerns with regard to ongoing extrajudicial killings, arbitrary arrests and detentions, torture and ill-treatment, denial of women and girls' rights to participate in many aspects of daily and public life, restrictions on the media and civic space, and the situation in places of detention. As per the report, from mid-August last year to mid-June 2022, UNAMA recorded over 2,100 civilian casualties. 700 of them were killed, while over 1,400 people were wounded. Although most of these attacks were carried out by the self-identifying Islamic State in Iraq and Levant, Khorasan province, known as ISLKP, it poses serious security questions before the Taliban that struggled against Western forces in the name of defending indigenous people and their rights. The report said the hardest hit victims were those associated with the former government and its security forces. It listed 160 extrajudicial killings, 178 arbitrary arrests, and 56 instances of torture and ill-treatment. Human rights violations also affected 173 journalists and media workers, 163 of which were attributed to Taliban authorities, including 122 arbitrary arrests and 33 instances of threats. The report has made a special mention of the rapidly deteriorating women's rights under the Taliban rule. The report indicated a dedicated ministry was responsible for imposing harsh curbs on women, taking away their fundamental rights. NAMA is particularly concerned about the involvement of two specific bodies in human rights violations, the de facto Ministry of Propagation of Virtue and Prevention of Vice and the de facto General Directorate of Intelligence. And they are specifically referenced in the report. As per the report, a number of Afghans speaking on the condition of anonymity have said that while they wanted the foreign rule to end, the Taliban leadership has not been what they were hoping for. Instead of a rise through indigenous means, the country has relapsed to a poor and further deteriorating humanitarian situation. The Afghans can only wonder how the situation will pan out in the coming days. For now, they can just wait, watch and pray for a better tomorrow. Since the Taliban seized control of Kabul last year, the speed of bad headlines has continued. A bomb reportedly exploded near the main gate of the Gurudwara Karte Parwan in Kabul, the day after the Taliban leadership publicly urged its minority populations to return, asserting that it had allayed their security concerns. The incident happened a month after Islamic State jihadists invaded the holy site, killing several members of the minorities. Take a look. 
as the Taliban approaches the one-year anniversary of taking control in August 2021. Bombings have intensified increasingly in Afghanistan. Recently, a bomb exploded near the main gate of the Gurudwara Karte Parwan in Afghanistan's capital, Kabul. The explosion occurred in a shop selling herbal medicines owned by an Afghan origin Sikh family. A video also went viral in which the owner of the shop selling herbal medicines explained that a time bomb was planted at his shop when he was away to have lunch at another place. Bomb blast in a shop near the gate of Gurdwara Karte Parwan in Kabul, Afghanistan on 27 July is yet another attack on the minorities staying in Afghanistan. It is the same Gurdwara where on 16 June terrorists had entered and had killed two devotees in the Gurdwara apart from causing immense damage to the holy shrine. The minorities in Afghanistan are very scared and with each passing day, more and more incidents are happening where either they are being attacked or their religious institutions are being attacked. A similar incident took place a month ago when two Islamic State terrorists targeted the Karte Parwan Gurudwara with grenades on 18th June morning, claiming two lives, including a Sikh, leaving the holy place vandalized. Religious minorities in Afghanistan, especially the Sikh community, have been targets of violence in Afghanistan. As of March 2020, there were around 650 to 700 Afghan Sikhs and Hindus in Afghanistan. However, since the attack on Gurdwara Har Rai Sahib in Kabul on March 25 that year, when 25 Afghan Sikhs were killed, most members of the community have been evacuating to India in batches. After the Taliban took over Kabul in August last year, three batches of Afghan Sikhs had arrived in Delhi, including former Sikh MPs Narendra Singh Khalsa and Anar Kali Kaur Honoryar. Around 160 Afghan Sikhs and Hindus are still stranded in Afghanistan and they are willing to resettle in India. Ever since Taliban has taken over power in Afghanistan in August last year, there have been regular bomb blasts and attack on women and minorities in Afghanistan. There is an environment of fear and hatred in Afghanistan as the Afghani government has done nothing control these violent acts happening in the country. It is high time that the Taliban government takes strict and swift action against the perpetrators who are causing violent attacks in Afghanistan and killing women and minorities. The war-torn country has witnessed a series of terror attacks staged by the Islamic State group in the last few weeks. Not only Afghan Sikhs and Hindus but Islamic State also has been targeting Muslim Shiites and Sufis. The Taliban say they have secured the country since taking power in August and largely eliminated the Islamic State's local offshoot. But international officials say the risk of a resurgence in terrorism remains. On one hand, Afghanistan faces an endless threat of terrorism. On the other hand, the country finds itself gripped by the severe restrictions imposed by the Taliban. People in Afghanistan had dreamed of peace and an end to conflicts to improve their situation, but not at the cost of losing the last 20 years of achievements. It seems that the forever war in Afghanistan is nowhere near its end. Let's turn our attention to the Balochistan province of Pakistan, where abuses of human rights have become the norm. In the pretext of security and territorial integrity, the Pakistani government and its security forces frequently violate the human rights of the Baloch people. 
They are often charged with treason, labelled as terrorists and either killed in clashes or arbitrarily taken in by security personnel. In order to stop the flagrant human rights violations in the province, Baloch political and human rights groups have requested the United Nations to intervene immediately. Our report. In Balochistan, human rights violations have become the norm. The Pakistan state and its security agencies have habitually trampled on the human rights of the Baloch people in the name of security and regional integrity. A large part of its young population has been the victim of enforced disappearances and extrajudicial killings. Recently, hundreds of people took to the streets of Islamabad and Germany against the fake encounters of the Baloch missing persons. Stop mentioning this Palestine! Stop mentioning this Palestine! The families of the victims staged a three-day sit-in protest in front of the governor's house in Quetta and warned that if the culprits of the Ziyarat incident are not brought to justice, the protests will be expanded throughout the province indefinitely. The protesters claimed that the nine men killed in the Ziyarat incident were Baloch missing persons who were picked up by the Pakistani security forces. They demanded justice for the victims and their family members and asked that the culprits be prosecuted and punished. They are uh, killing the Baloch missing persons, the persons who are missing from last five years, six years, seven years or maybe many of them are missing from since 12 years. They kill them in fake encounters. And after that, they dump their bodies and they show it that they have did an encounter of terrorist, terrorist forces uh, who are killing Pakistani army or so-called. But these were identified later on the Baloch missing persons. Their families are protesting on daily basis on Pakistan, in Pakistan on streets. Cases of enforced disappearances are endemic to Pakistan. According to the Commission of Inquiry on Enforced Disappearances, more than 7,000 enforced disappearances occurred in Pakistan since 2011 with over 700 enforced disappearances in 2019 alone. Such kind of disappearances in Pakistan are mainly based on the victim's ethnic and religious backgrounds. Not only the Baloch are being killed in fake encounters, they are also facing a dismal future, helplessly watching as the Chinese seize control of their mineral-rich country under the guise of the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, fortifying and enclosing locations like the port city of Gwadar. China is violating human rights in its occupied territory and has collaborated with Pakistan to exploit natural resources in Pakistan-occupied Kashmir, Gilgit-Baltistan and Balochistan. Therefore, common Baloch and Baloch leaders have been protesting in Pakistan's port city Gwadar against China's multi-billion dollar belt and road projects in the country. To suppress these voices of freedom, the Pakistani army and intelligence agency ISI are now floating all the limits of human rights by targeting Baloch women and children. Actually, we were facing human rights violations from Pakistan till the day they colonized Baluchistan in 1948. But the day CPAC started, the day uh, Gwadar mega project started, the day China entered, that human rights violations, they changed into genocide. Actually, they are displacing Baluch people from their ancestral lands to build Chinese and Pakistani settlements there. So. Uh, CPAC is just like just like uh, Baloch 
it's it's they are making a place that is baloch free like they they there should be no baloch they don't want to see any baloch there they just want our land and our ports and our resources so uh, baloch people have uh, seen uh, like uh, a kind of uh, genos the, the ongoing genocide is going on it's direct result of of cpac and uh, the people who have imposed cpac on baluchistan should be ashamed of themselves they sh they should be brought to international court of justice for what uh, they have atrocities they have done against people of baluchistan we want justice we want justice baluchs have faced extreme deprivation and marginalization from pakistan and it has resulted in a strong desire for liberation among them demonstrations against targeted killings and fake encounters are often held in balochistan and in western countries the protesters holding placards and banners chant slogans against inhuman atrocities in pakistan's resource rich province stop Balochistan. stop Balochistan. they are urging the international community to speak out against the genocide as the silence of the world community is giving impunity to pakistan in pakistan the links between the top army personnel politicians and terrorists have acquired a measure of legitimacy under the banner of Islam and Jihad. The establishment in Islamabad has been trying to disrupt peace in Kashmir using unholy alliance for several decades. During the Kargil war in 1999 also, Pakistan took the help of jihadists and today after two decades, the same rule and tactics are found to be existing in the South Asian country. A report. Exporting terrorism in Jammu and Kashmir has been a state policy of Pakistan for several decades. The country has been a significant force behind the growth of radicalism and extremism in region. Various terror groups in the Kashmir Valley benefit from Pakistani support as the assistance of Pakistan military covers the ambit of training, logistics, financial and doctoral support. More importantly, the army in the Islamic Republic also considers jihadists and terrorists its first-line defense. The unholy nexus had conceived the astonishing misadventure in the early spring of 1999 in Kargil when the intruders from Pakistan transgressed into the Indian territory across the line of control and had occupied fortified defenses. It nearly brought nuclear-armed neighbours, India and Pakistan, to the brink of their fourth full-scale war. However, giving a befitting reply, the Indian armed forces declared victory after driving out the intruding Pakistan regular army, along with jihadist mercenaries from the heights in Kargil. Recently, on the occasion of Kargil Victory Day on July 26, India paid tribute to the martyrs of war. We stand here along with the proud citizens of the nation in modesty to acknowledge the sacrifice in respect, gratefulness and gratitude. Kargil Vijay Divas commemoration is our way of remembering and reliving the saga of heroism and sacrifices that stand apart as a lesson to each citizen and motivate the youth to achieve the greater good. More than two decades since the victory at Kargil, Pakistan continues its efforts to bleed India with the help of Islamic terrorists unleashed by the same military jihadist nexus. Several terrorists captured during counter-infiltration operation by the Indian Armed Forces in Jammu and Kashmir have confessed to be being trained by the Pakistani army. They have revealed that they are provided money by their handlers to cross over and take armed supplies in the region. Many of these terrorists are handed first over to the notorious ISI and then to the Pakistani army and later to terror groups like the Lashkar-e-Taiba. 
While promoting terrorism to hurt India, Pakistan has completely ignored the fact that the country is sinking into its own jihadi strategy. Militarization of Pakistani society is a direct result of Pakistan's involvement in the jihadi policy in Kashmir. And many areas in Pakistan have become weapon bazaars where pistols, rifles, automatic weapons, grenades, mines and explosives are freely available. After the runover of Afghanistan by the Taliban, a huge amount of arms, weapons and equipment has fallen in their hands. This includes small arms, machine guns, etc. etc. A lot of these arms have been already handed over to Jaish e Mohammed and Lashkar e Taiba. It is very apparent that these two groups will try to push in these arms into Jammu and Kashmir. Because as we know, presently the status of level of arms which are available in Jammu and Kashmir is very low. And to put in these arms, a number of attempts at infiltration will be tried, a number of other methods such as dropping by drones, transportation through various uh, smuggling channels, etc., etc., will be attempted. Security forces are already aware of it and they are alert and I'm sure they'll be able to neutralize it. But we cannot accept these arms to be handed over to the various groups and then being infiltrated into India. Pakistan needs to understand that it can't defeat India neither through conventional means of warfare nor through proxy war. Rather, it would increase the possibility of division of its territory into smaller parts. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We will be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at anin.com. This is Shivangi Mishra signing off on the behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.